Welcome to Community of Love Christian Fellowship, where God loves you and we do too. Join us in person on Sundays from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. for 60 minutes of dynamic praise, inspiring fellowship, and life-changing worship. Point your GPS to 557 Cambridge Street in the Austin neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Visit us on the web at colcf.org. That's colcf.org. To learn more about our Friday evening services, our various ministries, and our upcoming special events. Now, let's join the service already in progress.
It is not happiness that brings us gratitude. It's gratitude that brings us happiness. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. Thanks to those who hated me, you made me stronger. Thanks to those who loved me, you made my heart grow fonder. Thanks to those who cared, you made me feel important. Thanks to those who entered into my life, you made me who I am today. Thanks to those who left, you showed me that nothing lasts forever. Thanks to those of you who stay, you showed me true friendship. Thanks to those of you who listen, you made me feel like I was worth it. What are you grateful for today? Gratitude can transform common days into thanksgiving, turn routine jobs into joy, and change ordinary opportunities into blessings. The root of joy is gratefulness. Someone else is happy with less than you have. We tend to forget that happiness doesn't come as a result of getting something we don't have, but as a result of getting something we don't, but, but as a result of recognizing rather and appreciating what we do have. Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. Even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. And look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. Gratitude is a habit of the heart. Be thankful for what you have and you'll end up having more. If you concentrate on what you don't have, you will never have. Have you ever thought about the amazing moments in life? Those moments when you come home late and you go straight to bed. When you buy amazing clothes that you found on sale. When you hold hands. When you have those moments that become your favorite memories. When you're talking on the phone until 5 in the morning, resting on the loved one's chest, taking long, long showers that wash away all of your worries. Feeling as though you finally belong somewhere, deciding what you want to do in your life, feeling satisfied after a satisfying meal. Falling asleep instantly when you're upset, meeting people that happen to change your life. When you have a great night of sleep, drinking a cup of tea, realizing that everything is going to be okay, a good friend, a warm embrace, a compliment when you needed it most, a beautiful smile from a loving stranger, a discount when you didn't expect it, a cash register that opens when you approach a miles long line in the store. You see, the miracle of gratitude is that it shifts your perception to such an extent that it changes the world that you see. Yeah. These are a whole host of quotes from a whole host of individuals that just scratch the surface of the many things for which we are thankful, grateful, and appreciative. And so I want to invite you to reflect with me on the topic of thanksgiving and attitude of gratitude. Yeah. Thanksgiving and attitude so in as much as we have found that in religious practice, in our families, in our communities, we have understood that the notion of gratitude somehow has a positive impact upon us. But even the psychological community has begun to explore this notion of gratitude. And in so doing, they've drawn a series of very interesting conclusions and have come to refer to it as the new science of gratitude. You'll find fun, Brother Pastor, the notion that this came from UC Davis. So in California, you know, we don't dare think, we don't, we don't mind thinking differently. They acknowledge that scientists are latecomers to this, but they have indicated that it's an integral component of health, wholeness, and well-being. In fact, according to Dr. Robert Evans of UC Davis, he found that those keeping gratitude journals exercised more frequently, had fewer physical concerns, and felt better about their lives as a whole. As a whole. They also were more likely to have attained their purpose.
personal goals in life, to have positive states of alertness, more likely to have helped someone recently, and those who may have been ill were more likely to have greater connections and positive moods even as they struggle with their various illnesses. I find that very interesting. So then I said, well, what do these words thankful, thanksgiving, and grateful really mean? So, as I usually do, I went to Merriam-Webster, which says that thankful is the state of being conscious of a benefit received or expressive of thanks and being well pleased. So for those of you who are my students, what's wrong with those definitions? I know, Joan was going to say it, right? You cannot define your word with the word itself. So that meant I had to go a little deeper. The word grateful is similarly defined as appreciative of benefits received affording pleasure or contentment. But somehow those definitions seem to fall flat. But at least we know there's some good thing that happens as a result of some good thing in which we express some good feeling. But is that really the full story? So in our scripture reading for today, we find the Apostle Paul, known by some as the joy theologian. He's reminding us in Philippians 4 of how they should live. Brother Paul, as you know, is always somewhere right in the middle, teaching somebody, training someone. So I want you to look with me to Philippians 4. And so here, here we find Paul in this place where he's imprisoned and he doesn't know his fate. But he's saying, Joy is the state of being what we are as Christians. And this is the part of the message that he is trying to convey here in the fourth chapter of Philippians, verses 4 through 8. These are what are referred to as Paul's final exhortations. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Now this is a brother who is essentially sitting on death Now, we say happy people in quotes because you all know some of those folks, they're happy people. They're always happy. 
They smile. Good morning, how are you? And the complainers are like, what's, what's, what's good about it? It's raining, my car broke down, my tires flat. What's good about it? So there are those of us who see the world where the glass is half full versus the glass being half empty. Some of us complain about the weather. We complain about the job, the spouse, the house, the teacher, the preacher, the friend, the foe. We can find anything to complain about. Or we can choose to remember, as Romans 8 and 28 also reminds us, that all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. The common element in all of this thanksgiving is the connection to God. That we must connect with God. We must love God. We must trust God. We must be in communion with God. We must constantly praise God. We must love God. We must relate to God. And then we can be like Paul. Then we can stand on the brink of our very potential death not knowing what will happen. But knowing that God knows all, knowing that God sees all, knowing that God intends to protect us, God intends to love us, that God intends to do all that God does for our good. And that God has sent his son into the world to save us. Now how can you see the world yeah. as dead and dry and sad and pathetic when you know that the game is rigged in your favor? We are to submit to him, we are to acknowledge him, we are to love him. 
reflecting upon the simplest way to demonstrate how God loves us. And I remember one of my children sitting about six inches from the floor in a chair. He wanted macaroni and cheese. I promised macaroni and cheese. He, he spent his entire day trusting and hoping and expecting that his mother would come. Knowing that there was something in that relationship. Knowing that there was love in that relationship. Knowing that something was going to happen. He didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but he knew whatever happened would be filled with love. He knew that though I had to go to work, he knew that though I had all kinds of things to accomplish during the course of that day, he trusted and believed in me. And when I walked, I'll tell you, he still doesn't know, but to this day, it almost killed me that that got on me cheese. I thought I was going to die. I didn't know what I was going to do to get that macaroni and cheese. But I managed to get a tray of macaroni and cheese from my deli at Northeastern University. And I took breadcrumbs and I made it beautiful. And when I delivered those, those, that macaroni and cheese, I got a look, a smile, I got love, I got thankfulness, I got hope, I got praise that I would never forget for as long as I live. And that is what God is calling us to do. That is what Paul is reminding us to do. So as I prepare to take my seat, I just want to remind you of three primary points. You already know that you're doing all right. Because some of us, while we're worrying about the shoes we have on our feet, when we look at the brother who has no feet, it ought to make us know that God is able. When we worry about the pain in our leg and we find somebody with no legs, we ought to be reminded that God is able. When we think about the headache we have and we realize that there are people with deformed heads, we ought to remember that God is able. When we think about what we have and that we had three squares yesterday, even if they weren't the gourmet squares, there were three more squares and somebody else right around the corner head. So the first point that Paul reminds us is do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Because God's going to provide. No matter what's going on, no matter what the weapons are that may appear to be before you, they will not prosper because God says so. 